you can never go too far. I said it before and I'll say it again. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. John Hughes was the Spielberg of teen movies, and in the 80s, any young actor would kill to be in one of his films. You know, it's all accidental. This is not, my career was not planned in any way. So why then, when Matthew Broderick was offered the role of Ferris Bueller, did he go, yeah, nah, I don't know. I don't want you to miss this. So before things get too fast, let's stop, go back to the beginning, and look around. The high school I went to, I went because they had a good theater, but my whole First year there, I was too afraid to audition to use that theater. I, mean, I wouldn't even, I didn't want to even go into the theater and audition. But the second year I was there, I finally, I had nothing to do and, and I had to do it. And I, I do remember a moment on stage while somebody else was talking and me thinking, I sort of like this. How am I ever going to play for the Yankees with a name like Eugene Morris Jerome? You gotta be a Tony, or Frankie, or Joe. And the winner is Matthew Broderick. This makes me very happy. It also makes me a little sad. James Broderick, for decades a highly respected stage, film, and TV actor, best known for the TV series Family. James Broderick died of cancer late last year, just before the year of Matthew Broderick. I'm sad because my father, Jimmy Broderick, did not live long enough to see this. I think it would have meant a lot to him, I know it would have meant a lot to me. Only I was born Italian. All the best Yankees are Italian. My mother makes spaghetti with ketchup. What chance do I have? So I would like to dedicate this award in honor, appreciation, and love of his memory. Thank you. I saw my father, you know, be out of work for a year, then get a big TV series, then be out of work for another year, and so maybe I don't get as uh, overwhelmed by it because of that. You know, like I don't trust it too much, in a way. Boy, it's hot. This is hot. Never got this hot in Brooklyn. It's like Africa hot. Tarzan couldn't take this kind of hot. Two years after receiving the Tony Award for his performance in Brighton Beach Memoirs, Matthew Broderick returned to Broadway in Biloxi Blues. It was another play written by Neil Simon, and would eventually be adapted for the screen in 1988 where Matthew would reprise his role as Eugene Morris Jerome. In the stage version, a lot of it was talking to the audience, so he's more of a narrator. It was my fifth day in the army, and so far I hated everyone. And in the film, most of that was taken out. There's some voiceover, but very little. Do I make myself clear, Jerome? Oh, yes. Oh, what? Oh, nothing. You having trouble understanding me, Jerome? Oh, no. I mean, no ho, Sergeant. It's just plain ho. Maybe I'm dreaming. My eyes are open, which means maybe I'm awake, dreaming I'm asleep. Or, or more likely, maybe I'm asleep, dreaming that I'm awake, wondering if I'm dreaming. So let's move on to some really heavy stuff. Lady Hawk. The film's directed by Richard Donner and stars Rutger Hauer as Navarre, Michelle Pfeiffer, last seen in Into the Night as Isabeau, and Matthew Broderick, whom you may remember from War Games, as Philip the Mouse. It starts with getting out of jail for me, and then a, a whole adventure through, uh, through escaping and, and meeting up with, with two people. It's not unlike escaping mother's womb. God, what a memory. In Lady Hawk, Matthew Broderick plays a character who throughout the movie prays to God. I have not seen what I have just seen. I do not believe what I believe, Lord. I told the truth, Lord. How can I learn any moral lessons if you keep confusing me like this? It always pays to tell the truth, Lord. Thank you. I see that now. While he's not speaking directly to the audience, he finds himself for the first time talking to the camera. We have come full circle, Lord. I would like to think that there is some higher meaning in all of this certainly would reflect well on you. We often praise actors who can play a diverse range of roles, ones who can portray characters so far from themselves that we begin to forget it's even them. 
A fear actors have is being known for only one thing. That fear is why many are hesitant to take on the role of a beloved character. Well, I guess what happens is if you're if you're successful in something, people want to repeat it and want you to, to do the same thing. The way they avoid being typecast is by never doing the same thing twice. Matthew Broderick found himself doing the same thing not only twice, but three times. And if he did it a fourth, he feared that it would not just be the wall he broke, but his chances of ever landing another role. I was backstage, I think, doing Biloxi Blues when uh, I, I got this, you know, the John Hughes was doing this film. Now I was somewhat known, so I got to, you know, get the script. I read it and I thought it was great. I had a teeny hesitation because having just done Brighton Beach and Biloxi, I was like, wow, I'm talking to the audience just like in these plays, like all I ever do is, and even in Lady Hawk, he talks to the camera a little bit, so I was like, Whatever it is, I'm not going to do it. I'm still a young man, you know. I've got prospects. You know, when you're young or starting out, you think, I, this is, I have to make, do something different. You have all these, you know, ideas about your career, like you can control anything. John Hughes was like, he was known as the Spielberg of teen film at the time. I think about an idea for a long time, and I, I know how it's going to begin, I know how it's going to end and most importantly, I know who the characters are. I was not that aware of it. I hadn't seen those movies, though. <laughs> nothing, no, nothing. <laughs> and I rented 16 Candles. Hi. 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 And I went to a screening of um, The Breakfast Club, and I loved them. Eat my shorts. You just bought yourself another Saturday, Mr. Oh, crush. And I only brought up the little hesitation when I was like, should I do this since I've been doing these parts for Talk to the Camera because my memory is telling my agent. Hello? You know, what do you think? Is this a good idea? I was telling my manager at the time. Yeah. And my memory is before I had hung up the phone, he was like, I'm serious, man. This is ridiculous. Behind me in the room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, you should do it. <laughs> because he... He did, he flew to New York. Right. I'll see you tomorrow. Let's just not talk about it anymore now. I'll see you tomorrow. And he came and was suddenly in the room with me saying, right. Where's your brain? Why'd you kick Where's me? Where's your brain? Why'd you kick me? Where's your brain? I asked you first. Yeah, I do think you should do it. And yeah. He was right. Let's take a moment to thank Matthew Broderick's agent for convincing him to play Ferris Bueller. Action. This role was his chance to not only talk to the audience, but stare directly at them. While Ferris Bueller wasn't the first character to break the fourth wall, he's arguably the most influential. In the movies I make, when a character breaks the fourth wall, I can't help but think of Ferris Bueller. Who are you looking at? Over here. Matthew's fear was valid. He wanted to take a day off from playing a character who talks to the audience. Now in both the Neil Simon plays, you talk directly to the audience. And now in this movie you do as well. Is that a coincidence? Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, unless it's just some strange <laughs> characteristic of mine that <laughs> makes me do that. I don't know. The, the, uh, the, it's ahead, very talk to the audience. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't I do one lousy thing right? But the truth is, while the day off is nice, <laughs> there's something to be said about consistency. <laughs> it's very different talking to a camera than an audience, you know. Why didn't you throw it? I almost did. I get so insane with myself sometimes. <laughs> then why didn't you throw the cup? I'm trying to control myself. Why? The audience laughs and reacts to you, and cameras just kind of sit there, except for the operators, you know. And uh, there he is. <laughs> why do you have to control every single thought in your head? Why don't you let loose once in your life? Do something that you feel like doing, and not what you think you're supposed to do. It feels a little weird talking to a machine, you know? You feel a little crazy at first. But when I got used to it, I enjoyed that part of the film a lot. If you're good at something, why not do it again? And again. And again. Is this luck, or, or is, it, is it chance, or have you been able to pick these characters? I didn't pick them, no. Some things are out of your control. And as a young actor, you take what you can get and hope that at the end of the day, the audience will buy your performance. Would you mind talking to him for me, Zach? I'd real- Time out. Hey, remember when uh, Zach Morris talks to the camera? My life is a nightmare. 
Now we've got to get out of bowling, get rid of building, and get our babes back. I've got a plan. Yeah. People think, oh, that was such a, a novel idea that you came up with. Like, no, that was done by Ferris Bueller. <laughs> yeah, this is horrible. I just meant to get a car. If I don't find a way out of this, my life at Bayside is over. Yeah, we were just copying him. I guess I'll be okay. They bought it. You're still here? You're still here? You're still here? What are you doing here? It's over. It's over. Do you have anything better to do? Go home. Go home. Go home. Go on, get going. Go. Get a life. Get a life and go home already, okay? Losers. Go.